Welcome to the show. My name is James Nielsen Watt, and in this show, we interview interesting, inspiring, and successful people so you can learn the secrets to success and can play the game of life, business, health, and happiness better. And the philosophy we take here is if I'm leveling up my game, you get to level up yours as well. So get ready to listen to some inspiring people who have figured out how to have success in all areas of life, health, happiness, wealth, business. We're going to be interviewing them in this show so that you can learn the secrets to success that they share with practical advice that you can take and use today. So if you enjoy the show, please subscribe, please leave us a review, and please share it with your friends because if I can help you and you can help others, then we can help more people together and we can all level up our game together. My guest today is a best-selling author, Kwame Christian, who's a lawyer, professor, and managing director of the American Negotiation Institute and a subject matter in the field of negotiation and conflict resolution. He's conducted countless specialized trainings worldwide and is a highly sought after keynote speaker. Kwame's TEDx talk, Finding Confidence in Conflict, was the most popular TEDx talk on the topic of conflict in 2017 and has been viewed over 250,000 times. Welcome to the show, my friend. Super excited to have you on. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. I'd love it if you can give our audience some context on you, what you're doing, and a bit of your backstory and how you got to where you are. Yeah, so my name is Kwame Christian. I'm the founder and CEO of the American Negotiation Institute. We conduct negotiation and conflict resolution trainings and make your difficult conversations easier. And so I'm also the host of the top-ranked negotiation podcast in the world called Negotiate Anything. Um, authored a book, Finding Confidence in Conflict. And then my second book is coming out in September of 2022 called How to Have Difficult Conversations About Race. What got you into this, man? Like, was it your plan? I'm going to leave school. I'm going to study a negotiation and just tear it up in that space. Or was this kind of something you fell into? Yeah, definitely fell into. So I, um, when I was an undergrad, I studied psychology. I wanted to be a, a clinical psychologist. That was always the dream. So at OSU, at uh, the Ohio State University, I should say, I always have to represent it the right way. So we have uh, my psychology degree and then undergrad uh, my uh, minors were in Spanish and foundations of law. Um, then I became enamored with uh, politics. So I went into grad school, made a switch and decided to do um, a law degree and a master of public policy. But James, you may be shocked to find out that after learning more about politics, I said, this is not what I want for myself or my family. <laughs> I, I, I don't like this at all. And so I, I stumbled into this class, uh, negotiation, and I just did it because it fit into my schedule. And um, for me as a re recovering people pleaser, that was terrifying, but I fell in love with it because I saw psychology for the first time so clearly in law. And then I realized something really life-changing that the difficult conversations that I was afraid of for such a long time, they're actually a skill, not a talent. I thought I was doomed to fail in all of these conversations. I thought it was just who I was. I was going to avoid these conversations. But then I learned that I could actually get better and improve. So we had a negotiation competition at the law school. Uh, my partner and I, we won that competition that gave us an opportunity to represent the school at the regional negotiation competitions in Ottawa, Ontario for the um, American Bar Association. And we won that, that competition as well. And then we represented the regions at the national competition in uh, Louisiana, uh, in New Orleans, and we made it to the semifinals. So I was hooked. And so I was addicted to doing it, but more so I, I wanted to let other people know that there was a better way there you could improve in this in this um, skill set. And so our motto at the American Negotiation Institute is that uh, we believe the best things in life are on the other side of difficult conversations. So as much as we we enjoy working with our, our corporate clients and doing coaching with business owners and things like that, really the revenue we make is to fuel our generosity, because that is what give us a, gives us an opportunity to pump more investment into the podcast, reaching more people. We're about to launch um, three new shows <laughs> this year as well, um, writing for Forbes and then writing these books. And so that's really the goal, just spread the message and have a, a large impact because we want to help people change their lives through the power of difficult conversations. I think that if more people had that skill set, objectively, everything would be better because you... the. The, the issue that I've run into is when 
people aren't able to communicate effectively, it builds resentment when they're not getting what they want. And then they think something's being taken from them because, well, you can just, you've got it easier. You can just talk better this and that. And it forms the sort of victim mentality, which doesn't help anybody. And so when I'm, you know, trying to negotiate a business deal or I'm trying to negotiate with my kid or my wife, right. Or, or anything, everything is, you know, in my opinion, at least I'd love to hear yours is everything is some kind of type of negotiation because there's something that, that I want to get out of it, whether that's for me or for you. And we need to have a dialogue and people just, when you don't, I, this is, you know, I'm speaking from personal experience here. When, when you just don't know how to do it, you, you struggle and then you get resentful and then your mindset shifts and then you pursue nothing. So if we were, if we could all have one skill, negotiation, better communication, I think, yeah, everything would be so much better. Well, James, I, I am happy to say that the indoctrination of you was quite easy. <laughs> I'm glad to see that. You're spot on. You're spot on. And our, our definition of a negotiation is anytime you're in a conversation and somebody in the conversation wants something. So it's harder to find a time when you are not negotiating. And you brought up a great point too. The, the people with whom we negotiate the most are the people who are closest to us. So I have a, I have a six-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, you know, the one-year-old makes demands more so than negotiates, but the six-year-old definitely negotiates and always having difficult conversations with Whitney as well, uh, who's my wife, who's also a, a doctor. You know, so it's, it's great to, to recognize that we have more power than we realize. We really do. And we have the power to improve the quality of our relationships, our lives, our communities, and our organizations through the power of difficult conversations and negotiation. I was about to ask, you know, when should we not negotiate? And then I realized as I was saying that, that if you're actively choosing to not negotiate, you're kind of negotiating uh, in a different way um, by allowing things to, to progress. For example, just because there's an opportunity for you to negotiate something better. Should you always do it? And then I guess if you're, you know, regressing from the negotiation is that part negotiation. Can you break that down for me? Cause I feel 100%. like 100. Yeah. Uh, this is great. Yeah. Cause we're, we're getting really Zen here, James, because there's always a negotiation happening. So in, either internally or externally, we're negotiating, right? So we're going to be negotiating with ourselves. We can and should negotiate with ourselves to determine what we want and why. And so that gives us clarity in the actual external negotiation. And to your point, you might realize that after you have that internal dialogue, think about it and, and go through this introspective process, you realize, you know what, this kind of this conversation, this issue that we're dealing with is, is simply counter to my values. So if there's something that is counter to your values, something that jeopardizes your safety or well-being, anything like that, then you probably shouldn't compromise on that. And one of the things I like to do is think about it from, a, from the future looking back. And so when I think about my performance, what I do and say in this moment, if I look at it from like a five or 10 year perspective, would I respect the decision that I made? And so I try to shift from the fear of failure to the fear of regret. So sometimes avoidance is not the right strategy. We should engage. And that theoretically, that wiser, older version of ourselves should look back on it and objectively tell us, no, you should stand up for yourself. You should have this conversation. Or the wiser version of ourselves says, actually, this is, this is counter to your values. You should just say no and walk away. It's not, it's not worth the conversation. But, you know, you still have to have the conversation to close the book, you know, to let them know that we're not negotiating on this issue. But I think if you have that internal negotiation first, it makes it a lot easier to have the external negotiation because you have clarity. For you, is there a, a difference between influence and negotiation? So if I'm, if, I'm a, if I'm better at communicating, I'm a better influencer, I can achieve more of what I'm wanting to achieve. I can help influence others to achieve more themselves. For example, we work with practice owners to, to help them get serious about business. And half the time they're talking themselves out of doing something that completely objectively is the right decision to make, but yeah. convincing themselves otherwise. And so if I genuinely care about that person and, and can get them a benefit, it's my duty to convince them uh, to take the action. If I know you're dying of dehydration and you believe you're dying of something else, I got to convince you to drink water. Otherwise you're going to die. And if I know that I feel an obligation to, to, to do so, how does that fit for you in terms of yeah, influence communication and negotiation? Are they the same? Are they different? 
I think it's for me conceptually, it's easier to consider it all one thing um, because the thing is a lot of times when we get into the, the semantic distinctions, there are some times where the clarity can lead to um, improved performance and decision-making, but then there are other times where it can kind of just muddy the waters and get in the way. So when you think about the way that I describe negotiation as anytime you're in a conversation and somebody wants something, um, somebody who's really deep into the persuasive arts, into negotiation and the art and science of it would say, well, technically as a negotiation is a process where both people understand that they are in a negotiation. Kwame, your definition is more closely tied to influence where you're steering a conversation and a person's behavior closer to influence and persuasion. But for me, I realized that a lot of these conversations, all we need to do whether it's a negotiation or just influence or persuasion, we just need to recognize that we can and should be more intentional about the way that we interact with people in order to sway the conversation as necessary. Because every time we're having a conversation and communicating with somebody, we're doing it in a goal-oriented type of way. Of course, there are going to be times where we're just hanging out, talking, <laughs> and we're just, you know, there's no, no agenda. That's fine. That happens from time to time. But like you said, as a coach, sometimes you're saying the person is here. I need to get them there. And now I'm trying to influence. I'm trying to negotiate whatever tool or uh, word you want to use, but it triggers you to actually be intentional and use a specific set of strategies and tactics to move the person there. So I think it's really more of a trigger, whatever word you decide to use to remember, hey, there are some tools that I have at my disposal to make this conversation effective. Well, to to your point, um, you know, you said sometimes we're just in a conversation and just, and just chatting. Uh, and I think you'll agree with me, but I might argue that there is, that's still a negotiation because the outcome is to have an enjoyment, uh, you know, an enjoying conversation or a progressive conversation or, you know, cause there's nothing worse to talking to somebody who, who does not understand that it's not going well. And you're just trying to escape. Whereas when you talk to somebody who's got a bit more of an artist in conversation, they, they can, they can draw you in and you have more fun and you share and you learn. And that's a, that's a skill of negotiation. I would, I would presume. Yes, 100%. And I think it's, it's a level of awareness to recognize when there's a shift in the conversation, because sometimes we might go in with our, our guard down and we're just having a conversation about the weather <laughs> or what we did last night or whatever. And so we're like, okay, yeah, this is... I, we're just chatting, we're just communicating. But then something happens in the conversation where they say, oh, what are you going to do tomorrow? You should do X, Y, Z or consider this. Oh, hey, okay. Now the conversation has shifted to a certain extent. Do I want to do this? No, maybe not. So I need to set up a boundary. That's kind of like a negotiation as well. Um, maybe they're trying to do something that's not good for them or for their company. Now I need to shift, you know? So I think it's more, it's about awareness because you're absolutely right. It could be one of those lower level conversations, but there still is a goal. Even if the goal is to just have a conversation where we end the conversation enjoying ourselves and a little bit closer than we were before. I can, I can hear uh, certain people saying things like, it doesn't always have to be a goal and why do you need to influence, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just saying this for the, for the sake of the conversation because I don't agree with that. It's like, well, if there is no goal and it doesn't have to be a goal of gaining, but if I'm having an interaction with a person, there, there, there's a goal of rapport building and connection and discussion and learning and fun. And otherwise, why are you doing it? Are you just going through the motions of, hey, because you know that question when everyone asks, hey, how's it going? They don't care. They don't want you to be like, oh, well, you know, I've got some shit going on right now. My baby's got you know, that. Like, oh, whoa, okay, bye. Like, they're just asking it. And so out of outside of that, um, we're trying to build deeper connections. And so being able to communicate effectively is, is, is a huge part of that. Let me ask you, um, how can we, how can we learn to be better negotiators, better influencers, better communicators, and then how can we teach our kids to do it as well? So we don't have to just keep learning it as adults. Yeah. I, I think one of the, the most important things to recognize is that this is going to be something that you're doing, whether you want to or not. So again, with the, the description of a negotiation, we're constantly negotiating. Whether, whether you did describe it as a negotiation or not, you're doing it. So you might as well want to like learn to do it well. But it has to start with desire. And we have to start with self-awareness to recognize that there's a discrepancy be between where we currently are and where we can and should be. And so James, for me, like we're both podcasters and we love having these conversations. And so we're at over... 
500 or so episodes on the podcast. And so I teach negotiation every day. I'm a professor at two universities. I've written books on it. But every single time that I have an episode, like I'm listening to somebody, I'm learning something new. No matter who it is, how old they are, whatever it happens to be, they approach it in a different type of way. So there's no end to how good you can get at this. And we're constantly engaging with other people. Do we want better relationships? Do we want to get more of what we want? Do we want to avoid unnecessary um, conflict and uh, disagreements? Yeah, of course we do. And so if we can get incrementally better, why wouldn't we? And so I think it has to start with that recognition, that humility, and then that desire. And then for the kids, what we have to do is this. We just have to model that. Because when I think about my, my son, constantly having difficult conversations with Kai, constantly negotiating. And it's so funny. My, my methodology of parenting is a slightly different from my, uh, my West Indian uh, heritage of the folks from the Caribbean. You know, uh, we would describe it in negotiation terms, uh, people who have immigrant parents. It's like, okay, yeah, this is called leverage. <laughs> you have no right to do what I say. Right. But what I want to do is I want to I want to convince Kai. I shouldn't say convince I, because negotiation when done right is the art of letting them have your way. I want him to believe that it is his Shit. choice. He's making that decision. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's it. And so I want him to learn through my example. And so there are times where he has conversations with me and I say, I was OK. I mean, you're out. <laughs> You're right. Okay, you win. All right. So why do I need to clean up if your room is messy? Okay, listen. I listen, listen, listen. <laughs> okay, that's a that's a fair point. That's a good question. Questions are at the foundation of, of negotiation. Well done, son, but I'm not happy about it. But I'm glad to see your, your skills are improving, right? So I think as far as uh, teaching our kids, I think it's first leading by example and then offering gentle correction when they go the wrong way. I I, I like what you said there because it's funny when You've got this balance. I've got two boys, uh, a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and they're very quick. So they will, they memorize things. They remember things. They, my, my three-year-old talks like he's a five-year-old. And so, but we've always been very aware of how we communicate and model that, how we deal with emotions in front of them. My wife uh, runs a, a coaching program uh, instinctualparent.com uh, and she teaches parents how to get back to their instincts with parenting and, and, you know, be more aware of their children's needs and wants and connections and things like that. And, and that's very much how we've sort of parented. And, and the irony is that, uh, you know, everyone quote unquote, well, as I say this, I, I realize it's probably not true, but we all want an easy kid, right? Doesn't talk back just does what we want, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which is why we tend to want to, to create leverage in that negotiation to get what we want because we want it now, our lives will be easier. But as me and my wife talk about regularly, we're not wanting an easy kid. We're not, you know, it's not my child. We're raising an adult and he's his own person. They're their own person. And we're trying to facilitate them having the, the skills to not just assimilate in the broken society, but to be able to transcend that and to be able to create change and all this sort of thing. Right. And so within that, it means that we're instilling these skills in our kids that, that ultimately create friction for us, just like you said, where, where he negotiated out of cleaning and you're like, Oh, dang it. But I want them to clean. And I find that funny because it's, it's the truth. It's like, we want to, we, we want to have our child have skills that are going to better them. And the best way of doing that is modeling it. So uh, not calling you out, but it's like, I want my kid to clean his, clean his room and keep things tidy. As my wife once said to me, cause I tend to be someone who, you know, it, if it makes sense, I'll do it. But like, otherwise I'll just live. However, it's like, no, I've got to, we clean up, you know, we do this because if I'm asking for something and he has the intellect and the ability to be able to communicate, but hang on a second, these don't make, these don't match up with what you're requesting from me. It never works. And I think a lot of us as parents struggle with that because we forget, Hey, we're raising a, an adult and I'm needing to instill a skill set. And how, how do I want them to be when they're older? Not just easy for me now. So you're right. Modeling is, it's the way to do it, right? It's, you know, you're spot you can't on. get negotiated out of it. 
Exactly. And that's the thing, too, because the example with Kai, uh, you know, asking that legitimate question is essentially pointing out my, my hypocrisy <laughs> exemplifies a really important part, part of negotiation, because a lot of the times we're so egocentric in our negotiations that we say that this experience needs to be a transformational t- for the person that I'm talking to. I'm talking to you. So you change because I'm already perfect. Why do I need to change? But the mindset of a good negotiator, a great negotiator is somebody who recognizes that this experience should be transformational for everybody involved. You should get better. I should get better. We should get better together. And so, yeah, did I get what I want when Kai cleaned the room? Yes. Yes, I did. But at the same time, I got better too, because he called me out and I cleaned my room because I needed to do that too. So you're absolutely right. And my mom, my parents hate when I say this, but we're on the same page, Raising an Adult, which is the title of a really great book, by the way, if you haven't checked that one out, I love that book. Um, I, I think about myself in terms of parenting towards obsolescence. I want to parent my child so well that he doesn't need me. Will I always be there? Of course you know, until, you know, my time comes, <laughs> but I'll always be a, 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 like a present parent. But at the same time, again, if I use more of these leverage power-based tactics and just force him to do things, he's complying, but he's not learning. And so if we use negotiation to get our kids to do the right thing, we're not only getting them to do the right thing, but we're investing in our future by teaching them how to make good decisions and why this was a good decision. So it it does create some friction at the time because there is a quote, easier way to do it, to just get them to do what we want through force, right? And just power and leverage. But I realized that down the road, if I teach him how to make good decisions, it makes parenting easier down the road because I'm teaching him how to think. Well, two things on that. Uh, Yeah. it, 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 in the short term, it's, there's difficulty because it would be easier just to, you know, quote, well, I say that like, it's not, it's not going to be easier. Cause I, I know that it's not going to be easier. And it's also not easy for me to then go and do that. But, you know, parents will use hitting or parents will take things away or, you know, give things. And, and it, it ultimately feels easy in the short term, but it creates difficulty later when the child gets older and thinks about it more and can then start using that against you. Not necessarily intentionally, but it's like, I'm not going to do it unless you give me this type of thing. And so we find in the short term difficulty in doing it the way that we're talking about, but over time it becomes not only better for the child, um, but it will be easier for us because we've got a, a more reasonable person that we can discuss with. And it's a person, but on the flip side, how well does it work when people try and do that to us? Government tries to make you stay inside, force you to, to, to do things that you don't want to agree to or need to, if they tried to, to ban certain things, you know, America, it's not going on at the moment. And, you know, it's like what happens? People get really upset. Whether it makes sense or not, it, they get upset. A, a toddler, a child is just a younger version of us and often are responding in the same way, just with less intellect. But it doesn't mean that's not happening in the same way, in my opinion. So we might be able to intellectualize why it's, you know, our, our position. But ultimately, we're just a, a growing baby. And, um, and we're responding the same. So I've, I've always taken that. I'm like, yeah, I just, I just, you know, frustrated. I just want to, you know, negotiate this way or, or give this or create leverage. But then I think about it for a second. I'm like, yes, but I, that wouldn't work with me. Right. So why am I trying to do things that I know don't work for me when I'm older and I'm conditioning my child to it's, it's interesting. It goes deep. I think when you think about it longer yes. than five seconds. <laughs> exactly. It gets really deep, really fast. And I, I think about it in terms of um, like toothpaste, you know, if you have a like a half empty tube of toothpaste, you squeeze in one area. It's not that the toothpaste disappeared. It just moved to another area. And so, for instance, if you think about leverage and power based tactics, what we're doing is we're taking away somebody's autonomy and control. They feel controlled. And even if they do what you're asking them to do, you've pushed their desire for control in another area. So they say, okay, James, I see what you have here. You have the leverage, you recognize that you're using that. So, okay, I'll sign this contract right now. But I will tell you that the only thing keeping me in place is that contract. The second you go out of line, (laughs) I'm going to find my power and I'm going to leverage it against you, right? And so when I think about negotiation, I think about my goal is to to have deals that are self-enforcing. 
if the person feels as though they were part of the decision, they freely made that choice, then I'm a lawyer. Of course, you always need to have a contracted business, but you don't need to rely on the contract for compliance because the person wants to comply because they feel as though they were part of it. But that's why we need to make sure that we're empowering people through the negotiation process. We can't just take away their power and use it through force. Well, enforceability gets tough in all situations because if you've, you know, you've got, you've got kids, uh, how far do you go with a toddler that's pushing against the, who, who cannot negotiate because their biology is telling them, I need to learn how to say no, I need to learn control for the sake of control. And like you said, you know, my, my, if, if I'm seeming to be controlling my toddler's entire environment, it, it, that toothpaste moves and it becomes about why I'm not going to wear pants or, yeah. you know, you can't make me do this. And so, uh, you know, we, we tactically uh, offer options that uh, gives the illusion of control, but ultimately ends up in the same destination. Um, uh, and I think that that kind of idea of inception and done in a way that is not manipulative is, is super important in, in a negotiation, like you said, because it benefits, it, it helps the person to experience the benefit without feeling like you've made them do it. Because even if it, I know it's right for me, I'm not going to do it just based on the fact that you're trying to make me do it. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Um, tell us about uh, your new book uh, that you're, you're launching and when you're launching it. Yes. The career risk book. <laughs> Yes, I tell you, you know, it would be a lot safer for me to just stay in my lane, negotiation and conflict resolution. But I want to be where the, the hardest conversations are, James. And I started writing this in 2020 um, because when you think about the, the social unrest that we experienced, um, I realized that people needed a resource that they can use to have conversations that are constructive and not destructive. And that's really what we want to do, because when it comes to these difficult conversations, when it comes to managing emotions and those types of things, there's a the methodology that we can use. But people don't know about that methodology and they, they don't know that it could be applied to these sensitive topics. And so that's really what I'm trying to do with this work. The, the book launches uh, September 13th, and I'll, I'll give you the link so you could put it in the description for the, uh, for the pre-orders. And I know personally speaking, it'd be helpful uh, for pre-orders more so than uh, the, the regular orders after the 13th, um, because we just want to get it into as many hands as possible so that you can be prepared. And here's the thing. I, I don't think, I haven't heard many people who wake up in the morning and they're like, you know what I want to talk about today? I want to have a, a sensitive conversation about racial issues in America. That sounds like a great way to spend my time. Uh, I think a lot of times these conversations, as much as people try to avoid them, they will ambush you. So if you want to have the conversation, it'll be a resource that you can actually be effective in the conversation. And a lot of leaders are finding that they're, in these situations where these conversations are kind of thrust upon them. And now part of their leadership description that they did not anticipate is having really sensitive conversations with their employees, their staff um, about race. And so I want to give people a resource that, that make these conversations a little bit easier and makes it less likely that you end up inadvertently offending somebody or, or getting, <laughs> getting canceled or anything like that. It's a, it's an interesting topic. And as a New Zealander, uh, watching America because I've got a lot of American clients. It's it's an it's an interesting experience to say the least. There is there seems to be a lot of focus on it and a lot of heated emotion and a lot of discussion that was never a part of being raised in New Zealand to the same degree. Like there seems to be a heavy focus on race uh, in America. Um, I grew up very multicultural. Aucklanders very multicultural and it's not that racism doesn't exist, et cetera, et cetera, but there seems to be a, a lot less of a focus on it. A lot less of a, I was just less aware. My friends were Polynesian, Maori, Asian, et cetera. And there's a lot less of a focus. Um, why do you think that is? Why do you think it's so heated in the States and so emotional? Because that massively influences the, the logical conversation, conversations around uh, things that are actually going to make change when there's mm -hmm. so much emotion involved because it creates irrationality on both sides. Yeah. Logic, James, what is, what is logic? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> I think that's what ends up happening. We were like, where I thought logic mattered. I, lo I thought facts mattered, you know, but I think the, the reality is that perception matters too. 
and different people's perceptions and lived experiences are going to inform the way that they look and the, the, the way that they see things and the way that they look at the situation. And um, I, I would say that it, there's something unique about American culture where we are, um, we're willing to speak our minds. Um, and I mean, it's, in, it's the first uh, the first uh, thing in the Bill of Rights, right? The freedom of free uh, free speech, right? And so that's been really codified and uh, uh, and absorbed by the majority of the population. And I think one of the things that's interesting about the United States is that this we were having some significant racial issues um, relatively recently in our history. Like Martin Luther King's uh, assassination is less than a hundred years ago, it, which is kind of wild to think. That's still recent memory. There are people alive who remember that, which is wild. So I think it's still fresh in that regard. And then there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, when we think about it. I don't want to say politically speaking, but there are political challenges. But I would say policy wise, where we haven't really done enough to address some of the inequities that exist. And so there's still a lot of these um, old wars that still have to be fought in order to get um, equality in different in different ways. But it's such a sensitive issue because it's tied not just to like identity in terms of who we are, but also identity in terms of what we believe and what we want to be true as well. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody wakes up and says, you know what, I want to be racist today. <laughs> I, know I don't, I, there are very few people who do that. Um, but I don't think a lot of people realize the racial impact of some of the things that they say or and or do. And so it's important for us to be able to communicate that well, but not communicate it in a way that triggers what I call reflexive reje rejection. So it's like, hey, you called me racist. I have no choice but to say no to that. Regardless of what the facts are, I can't accept. So I'm just going to say, hey, I'm Kwame the racist. And uh, <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to own that. You can't do that. Right. But we put these we put people in these unwinnable positions where the their only path to victory in the conversation is for the person to admit that they are morally corrupt. You know, that's that's kind of tough to do really tough to do. So blanket, I think blanket that, me as well, you know, exactly, exactly. So there's a better way to structure these conversations. You can still make the same points and we can share the perspective. So again, it's transformational for both people because nobody in the conversation knows everything. Nobody in the conversation is 100% right. But if we approach it in a more open and humble way to try to learn from each other, then we can collectively get closer to right and solve problems and then work together in the process. Because a lot of times we are, we are a lot closer than we think on these main issues. Yeah, because as, as you put it, going into that conversation, if I've got a, a point to prove I need to feel validated, then the way that I'm positioning that conversation and blanket, you know, you're racist, et cetera, uh, immediately I'm going in to win in that regard because I'm wanting to, to feel good. And then you're, you, you're going to have to reject that because you would never blanketly think that because there's context and, and how you view yourself. And so there's immediately going to be a conflict because as you pointed out, the, the condition of a good negotiation is that we all uh, improve and grow and, uh, and, and it's not one-sided because then it's leveraged and, and that leads into, you know, interesting conversations around cancel culture and things like that, which is heavily leveraged uh, negotiation. And it, it just doesn't serve, you know, the greater good because there is no improvement from that. You just cancel. Um, I think that's gonna be a very, very interesting book. Um, and I'm definitely going to pick up my copy myself, uh, just Appreciate to that. have that because it's, there's an application that, that goes beyond race as well uh, in terms of all, as you said, difficult conversations, uh, that, and by difficult, I, I presume to mean emotionally charged, uh, conversations. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Cause think about the word you said, and you talked about logic, but logic goes out, of, out the window when you introduce emotions. And the reality is when we have these conversations, we have to address the emotional issue in order to earn our right to talk about facts, logic, reasons, data. Because the reality is that there's a difference between facts and feelings, but in the moment they feel the exact same way. So I might say something that is factually inaccurate, but if I'm very emotional, I believe it. And the fact that you are, you are bringing up legitimate points to counter my points, I will reject it because it doesn't feel right. It's a different thing, right? And, and so yeah, most yeah. people resort to just, um, hey, I made a point. I used data. I used logic. It didn't work. I'm going to say it louder this time. That'll work. 
I, no, James, there's a better way. There is a better way. hundred um, percent. Man, we could talk about this for a long time. Uh, something that, that, that I want to say before we transition is I find that in, in, in all negotiation situations where uh, there is a lot of emotion involved, it tends to be loudest uh, by those who have the least amount of information. And it's that, it's that, uh, par- what, are they, what are they called? Paradox of knowledge or, or, or something where as we learn more, we start to understand we know less. And there is a point uh, where we have enough knowledge to be dangerous because we think we know, um, but we know so little that we, we can't know that we don't know. Um, and with a lot of these sorts of things, there's a lot of that going on because we all feel we want to be a part of the discussion because my opinion is valid. And for me, it's like you, you your, your opinion, your right to have an opinion is valid, but that doesn't mean that we all need to hear and bend to the opinion uh, <laughs> because you've had it. And I think that uh, a, a lot of us struggle with that because it, it, it attacks our own internal validity of, of that I, I matter in a discussion. And there's this duality of like, I, I, I matter, but maybe I should just be staying quiet uh, and, and allow people who have more of the information to have a more reasonable conversation that doesn't have so much political and emotional and, 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 and pressure, because even the best of us can be swayed by that when we have people behind us who meaningfully are emotional, but it, it, it jades how we then express that and, and, and messes the whole conversation up. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know? 100%. And th- this is something I talked about in the book. It's the uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, That's uh, where the people who are who know the least are the most confident. <laughs> and so I tell the story about back when Kai was two years old, I, I went into the, uh, to the backyard and I saw him standing up on his little play chair, reaching up into the sky. And I was like, hey, hey, Kai, what are you trying to do? And he said, I'm trying to touch the moon. And so in his two-year-old mind, he was doing this because he thought it was possible, but he could not fathom just how impossible what he was doing was, right? Or attempting to do. We've been there one time, right? And some people don't even think we did it, <laughs> you know? And so the, the reality is he was really confident just because he didn't have enough information. And when we're talking about race, when we're talking about policies, like public policy, uh, we have to recognize that these things are incredibly nuanced. And if we just wake up one day and you might be really smart, you might be a rocket scientist. That doesn't mean you understand policy, right? And so I think really one of the challenges is that there is a an information asymmetry, an understanding asymmetry, and a lack of empathy as well, um, because people are experts in their own lived experience, but a lot of times those lived experiences are discounted by people who have not lived that experience, right? And then we try to solve really complex policies, policy challenges with simple solutions. And we think it's possible because we just don't understand the barriers to get there. So one of the challenges that we have to, that we have to overcome is recognizing that we are often coming at these conversations, not only with different lived experiences, not only with different perspectives and beliefs, but also different levels of understanding. So we have to take the time to figure out what the other person believes and why, even if we disagree, because that's the only way we can understand where they are to get them where we want them to be. Because it's, it's not just literal, uh, literally sort of where they are. It's, it's sort of figuratively too, right? Like if I, if I've believed something to be true my entire life and my experiences have confirmation bias for me, um, and my environment has enabled, I can know 100% that this is the truth. And that can't be changed because I've experienced it. But the reality is the, the perception is subjective and, and we can believe something to be true and it, and it turns out not to be true. And it's like, how do you help that person to move forward when they see a wall, feel a wall, or et cetera, et cetera, whatever analogy you want to use here. And it's like, that, no, that's solid because they may never actually have pushed through or they may never have, you know, accidentally bumped into it and gone, Oh, it doesn't exist. I, I see that with, with clients and how they believe marketing should work or, you know, creating treatment plans, like basic stuff. Um, and so back to kids, for me, it's, it's been a lot about, uh, well, why do you believe that? Why do you think that? And then helping my child to think uh, wider, so to speak, and pressing against these things that we know to be true 
and going, oh, it's actually a lot of it is not actually true. Or there is actually other opportunities or different things so that I can have more of a, a wider perspective. Otherwise, I'm raised in New Zealand, you know, I experience these things, et cetera. And how I see the world is, is influenced by that. So thinking, thinking bigger, and that starts with being able to be a better negotiator for yourself, audience, everybody listening. This is an internal thing too. Uh, and then obviously interacting with others. Um, can you give us three quick things to help us all be better negotiators, whether that's for our, with ourselves, with our spouse or in our workplace, et cetera? Definitely. I'll give you one thing with three steps. And so it's the compassionate curiosity framework. And so this is the framework for all of our difficult conversations. So I introduced this in my book, Finding Confidence in Conflict. It's the basis for the uh, the, the strategic conversations and how to have difficult conversations uh, about race. And then every high level negotiation training that I do for my team. So it's three steps because most likely under pressure, you're not going to remember anything more. So James, let's keep this simple. And so number one, Acknowledge and validate emotions. Number two, get curious with compassion. And number three, joint problem solving. So acknowledge and validate emotions, get curious with compassion, joint problem solving. So it addresses the emotional component by helping you to overcome that emotional barrier. Then you learn about the situation, but you do it with a compassionate tone by ask, getting curious with compassion, asking open-ended questions. And then step three, joint problem solving, you're working with the other side to reconcile your, your differences and figure out what the, the best path forward is. And it helps you to understand what to say and when to say it for maximum impact. So the challenge for your audience, in addition to buying the book, <laughs> is, to is to try the, the framework because most likely you're going to have an opportunity to have a conversation with a human. You're not going to agree on everything and you have a framework now. So just use the compassionate curiosity framework and it'll make your conversations easier. Clients, you guys who are listening to this, uh, you know who you are. Um, this is ironically the three-step uh, process that we take for objection handling in a sales conversation. Um, and it's just articulated uh, better. I like it. I'm going to switch this <laughs> because it's true. You've got to acknowledge the emotion. You've got to, to have curiosity with compassion around what's going on. And then you've got to joint problem solve because there needs to be this inception of the idea because if the person is in on it themselves, they don't feel leveraged into it. They, 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 they buy it and they own it. And this goes from, I'm thinking about this, you know, why did this goes for employees? This goes for your, for your spouse. Um, I heard a funny, I'll, I'll round this out and I heard a, heard a funny uh, thing, you know, when you're, and this is super biased, but it's true for me. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to, to help my wife decide what she wants to eat for dinner and posing the question of what do you want to have for dinner opens up stress and the, the, the number of fights that you know, collectively around that are, are larger than, than anything else. And I think some of us can have had that experience. And I saw something that was on TikTok, something like that. And they said, they, they slid into the video and they said, you ever have this problem? This is how to solve it. Instead of asking what they want, just say, we're going out for dinner. It's going to be a surprise. And then they'll like whatever you suggest because it was a surprise. And uh, I loved that. And I tested it and it worked. We went to where somewhere sushi. And had I asked the question, uh, hey, what do you want to have? Should we have sushi? It would have been, no, I don't feel like sushi. And by the way, guys, this is all said with you know irony and love, right? Uh, and those looking to, to cancel. And then we, we came out and I said, you know, we're going to dinner. It's going to be a surprise. And then we went to sushi and she loved it. And the, what I take from that and looking at this is there's a joint problem solving. She wants to have a nice experience. She wants to be treated. She wants to feel, uh, you know, part of it. And so instead of me and her knowing that I'm just trying to decide on what to have for dinner. And she knows that let's make it a joint experience, a joint problem solving. She gets a nice time out. That's a surprise that I've thought of. And I get to just have the dinner and decide on something. So let's end on that. But Brilliant. I thought that was funny. I love that. Well, I know what I'm doing this weekend, James. I appreciate that. That's awesome. That's a surprise. <laughs> oh, great. And then the funny thing on the video was at the end that he filmed it and his, his girlfriend and wife was in the background. And she's like, do you do that? And he goes, I don't know, do I? And then like slid out of the video and she was honest face of like, oh my, oh my God, my life is flashing with my eyes. I thought there's all these surprises. But yeah, I thought it was hilarious, but it, it, it leads to that acknowledging the emotion, curious and uh, with compassion and joint problem solving. That was brilliant. One last question. What's the most important thing you ever learned? Oh, the most important thing that I ever learned is that I can improve. 
And I think that's the basis of everything I do, everything I teach, just helping people recognize that what they want to have out of life is within reach. You just need to get better and there's a path forward. I love it. I, I couldn't agree with that more. It's my, been my personal experience and it's something that I try and instill, instill into my kids every day. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can our audience connect with you online? Yes, LinkedIn is the best uh, social media channel. So um, Kwame Christian on LinkedIn, um, all other social channels, uh, Kwame at Kwame Negotiates. Um, usually people just follow me on Instagram to see my kids because <laughs> they're cuter than me, right? But, um, but yeah, definitely check out the books, uh, How to Have Difficult Conversations About Race, and then the podcast too, um, uh, Negotiate Anything. Thank you so much, my friend. This was amazing. Take care. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for checking out this episode. If you liked it, please make sure to subscribe and share it with your friends. And if you're a healthcare professional who wants to get serious about business, check out practiceowner.com where we have a whole lot of resources on helping you to grow more impactful and more financially viable practices. So that's practiceowner.com. Go and check that out if you're a health professional serious about business and don't forget to subscribe.